Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. We begin with Allah's blessed name. We praise Him and we glorify Him as He ought to be praised and glorified. And we pray for peace and for blessings on all His noble messengers and in particular on the last of them all, the blessed Prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. As we greet you from Hotel Margala in Islamabad in Pakistan with Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. This is today the last uh, session that I'll have before traveling. And uh, we thank Allah, we thank Him for all that He has done for us these last three months. They have been tumultuous months for me and they've not been easy at all. But I was blessed to have a wonderful team. Not only the men, but the wives who supported them, yes. And because of that wonderful team who have supported me and helped me, Alhamdulillah, we've now reached the last lecture. But today's lecture is connected with a lecture delivered in Peshawar uh, yesterday, was it yesterday? Yes, yesterday at the Iranian Cultural Center on the topic of the Messiah and the Imam. And today's topic is uh, the Quran and the return of the Messiah. This subject comes before that one. So when it goes on the YouTube channel, we put this one first and that one second because the two are connected with each other. Allah's Messenger prophesied amongst the signs of the last day that Nabi Isa alayhi salam, the son of Maryam, would return to the world. This constitutes the most important event now remaining to occur in history. Nothing can compare with this. And yet no university teaches this subject. <laughs> it's taboo. And so you graduate with your bachelors and masters and PhDs from universities all around the world, including Pakistan, with no knowledge of this subject. And if you want to study the subject that is of such paramount importance, the return of the Messiah. And if Allah has spoken in the Quran and He has said, Ba'dawuzi billahi min shaitani rajim, He has said, وَنَزَّلْنَا عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابَ تِبِيَانًا لِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ وَهُدًا وَرَحْمَةً وَبُشْرًا لِلْمُسْلِمِينَ That we have sent down this Quran on thee, O Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam, that it might explain all things into the end of the verse. Uh, which surah of the Quran is this? You're not going to get away today, in my last lecture. <laughs> yes? Surah al Anbiya. Next. Next, I can't hear you. Surah Sajda. No? <laughs> no? Huh? No? <laughs> no, I think you got your degrees in, um, in guesswork. <laughs> Surah al Nahl. No, I expect better from my students, eh? Surah to Nahl of the Quran. And Allah says that I have sent this book to explain all things. Well then, if this is the most important thing remaining to occur in history, would the Quran not explain this? Of course. The Qur'an must explain the return of the Messiah. 
But Allah in His wisdom has chosen to send the Quran, not only the Quran, but the previous scriptures as well, with two kinds of verses. The first one, ayat muhkamat, and you don't need a PhD to understand them. They're plain and clear. They don't need to be interpreted. There's no symbolism involved. Like the sun and the moon and 11 stars. But then he's given us the second kind of verse, and they are called ayat mutashabihat. And what are these? These are verses which have to be interpreted. So, for critically important information connected with Akhiru Zaman, Allah has chosen to give you the task of searching for it and diving down deep to get it. It's not going to come on your plate like Dumba Karahi, you just eat. I just came from Peshawar, that's why I spoke Dumba Karahi. <laughs> you got to deep dive down to get it. You got to think. And that's what we're not doing today. C kindly excuse me, I'm going to be blunt. Oh yes, I'm going to be blunt now. We stop thinking. And that's why the Quran can no longer guide us because we lack the capacity to think and the proper methodology for study of the Quran. And so now, let us begin. <laughs> there are two people who believe that the Messiah will return. They both believe that the son of Maryam, alayhi salam, was the Messiah. And they are the Christians, or in the Quran they are called an Nasara, and the Muslims, the followers of Nabi Muhammad. They both believe that the Messiah was Nabi. And they both believe that the Messiah will return. We don't have the time today to explain where did the term Messiah come from? What is the function of the Messiah? What is the definition of the Messiah? We don't have the time for that today because we're dealing with the return of the Messiah. So we assume that our audience already knows. But there, there is another group of people called the Jews and they reject. Nabi Isa Jesus, as the Messiah. One of the reasons why they reject him is because they say, well, his mother was not married and she gave birth to a baby. So he is a, a, a excuse me, a bastard child and she committed sin. And he therefore cannot be the Messiah. Allah tested them and they failed the test. The second reason why they have rejected him as the Messiah is because they sentenced him to death in their uh, court, Jewish court. And having sentenced him to death, they demanded of the Roman government to execute him. And they want him to die by crucifixion. Why? Because in the Torah it is written, that whoever dies that way is the cursed of the Lord God. So when they saw him die on the cross before their very eyes, this was evidence as plain as daylight he could not have been the Messiah. So they're still waiting for the Messiah to come. And Allah's messenger told us, as Nabi Isa told his followers that Allah was going to send someone whom Allah will create who would impersonate the Messiah and take them for a ride and it's the last ride on which they'd ever go. We begin our 
subject of the Quran and the return of the Messiah with this event, the event of the crucifixion. And from the time we address this subject, we are confronted with a monstrous roadblock. We don't know where it came from, who did it, but we have to overcome that roadblock if we are able to proceed forward. We'll come to the roadblock in a moment. What does the Quran say about the crucifixion? Number one, Surah to Nisa of the Quran. Wama Kataluhu, they did not kill him. Number two, Wama Salabuhu, and they did not crucify him. That's two. The same verse of Surah to Nisa goes on to say something more. It says, Walakin shubbiha lahum. And Allah made it, but rather Allah made it appear to them that he was crucified. Three. So now then, if Allah made it appear to them that he was crucified, how did he do it? Since this book explains all things, you can take your imagination and put it to sleep for the moment. <laughs> we don't need your imagination. What does Allah say before you talk? Okay? Is that agreed? Let us go to the Quran before you start to Im imagine. We have to leave Surah Tunnisa, in which we have been told three things. And now go to Surah to Ali Imran, which is the Surah before Surah Tunnisa. And when we quote the Quran, we only need to tell you the name of the Surah. We don't have to tell you the number of the ayah. That's your homework. <laughs> And in Surah to Ali Imran, we are told a fourth. And we are told a fifth concerning the crucifixion. Nabi Isa al-Islam is to be crucified and he doesn't know what's going to happen. So Allah speaks to him, first person, direct speech. And the conversation is recorded in the Quran at that critical moment when he is to be crucified. What does Allah say? He says, Ya Isa, O Jesus, alayhi salam, inni mutawafiq, وَرَافِيُكَ إِلَيْكَ وَمُتَحِّرَكَ مِنَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا وَجَعِلُ الَّذِينَ تَبَعُوكَ فَوْكَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا إِلَى يَوْمِ الْكِيَامَةِ إِلَى أَخِدِ الْآيَةِ Oh Jesus, I am going to take your soul Inni mutawafiq. I am going to take your soul. Warafiuka ilaik. And I am going to raise you unto myself. Wamutahiruka minalladina kafaru. And I'm going to cleanse you of what they have hurled against you, these people who have committed kufr. 
وجعل الذين تبعوك فوق الذين كفروا إلى يوم القيامة and I'm going to cause those who follow you and Imran does not follow him I don't know about you I know about myself I follow Muhammad والسلام I'm going to cause those who follow you oh Jesus to be raised above and in a position of dominance over those who have committed kufr against you and when I do that and raise them to that position of dominance they are going to remain in that position of dominance until the end of the world did you hear that have you ever heard this before <laughs> yes this is in the Quran so now we know that Allah took his soul Wafat is taking of the soul and the Pakistani who just speaks Urdu has no problem do you use that term? Huh? shake your heads <laughs> you all do it Fautogia. he died he died <laughs> and when you make the Salatul Janaza Allahumma man ahiyaitahu minna fahihi al Islam. O oh Allah, whoever you cause to give life to, grant that he may live in Islam. Waman tawafaitahu minna fatawafahu al iman. And whosoever you cause to die, that he may die with a state of faith. So you already identify wafat with that. <laughs> and yes, there's no problem with that. Because the taking of the soul is an integral part of death. Yes. Except that when Allah takes his soul, he can do two things. He can either keep the soul, in which case, you're dead or or what he can return the soul in which case you didn't die is this possible can Allah take the soul and return it is that possible let's ask the Quran <laughs> Surah to Zumar of the Quran and what does Allah say about this subject? He says, Allah who yatawaffal anfusahina mawtiha. Allah takes the souls at the time of death. The taking of the soul is an integral part of the process of death. The pronouncement of talaq is an integral part of divorce but if you pronounce talaq only someone with the intellectual acumen of a donkey and unfortunately we do have some people like that will say divorce has taken place <laughs> no the pronouncement of talaq initiates a process and it is only when that process is completed that the divorce takes place. So take this rubbish and throw it into a garbage bin that you can divorce a woman in half of a minute. Take this rubbish and throw it in the nearest garbage bin. That by just making a pronouncement of talaq one, two, three, or 25,000 times in half of a minute, okay throw it in the garbage bin because the hadith cannot be in conflict with the Quran and so taking the soul is not death <laughs> taking the soul is part of the process of dying 
And when Allah takes the soul, Allah takes the soul at the time of death. وَالَّتِي لَمْ تَمُدْ فِي مَنَامِهَا And those who do not experience this while awake, they experience it while sleeping. فَيُمْسِكُ الَّتِي قَدَى عَلَيْهَا الْمَوْتِ For those for whom death is written, he keeps the soul. And then, Listen. وَيُرْسِلُ الْأُخْرَى إِلَىٰ أَجَلٍ مُسَمَّةٍ And the others he sent back the soul for a period of time that is determined. Mm. And so when Allah takes a soul, there are two possibilities. Although Mirza Ghulam Ahmad tells us it's three. When <laughs> Allah takes a soul, there are only two possibilities. The first, that he will take the soul and keep it. In which case, Fautogia, he's dead. The second, that he will take the soul and return it. Okay? The third, of course, is Mirza says you can send him to Kashmir and he die and be buried in Kashmir. <laughs> so, Surah to Ali Imran informs us, number four, that Allah took the soul. And then Surah to Ali Imran informs us, number five, that Allah then raised him unto himself. So we now are forced to ask the question, well, when Allah took the soul, what happened after that? There are only two possible answers. If Allah took the soul and kept the soul, he's dead. But Allah says, no, they didn't kill him. They didn't crucify him. So now we're left with only one answer for people who think. For people who think and for whom the Quran is the primary source of knowledge and who recognize the Quran as absolute truth. How few there are today that Allah took his soul and so they thought he was dead. If I was there, I would also think he was dead. And then Allah returned the soul when no one could see. And then Allah raised him unto himself. If Allah took his soul and then returned it, it's the same thing like the woman, let me tell you the story. She had a heart attack. So they call the ambulance, the paramedics they call. So they came and they checked her out. No sign of life, but they put her in the ambulance and they took her to the hospital. When she arrived at the hospital, they checked her and they read, they wrote, dead on arrival. So they sent the body in a place called the morgue. And then a doctor has to come to perform what is known as a post-mortem to find out the cause of death. So when a post-mortem takes place, the body is naked. And the doctor has his sleeve rolled up, he has a knife in his hand, and when he's about to cut her, she opens her eyes. And she sees this man with a knife, and herself naked, and she screams out. So the doctor replies with the certainty that medical science always has when it's confronted with religion. The doctor said, Madam, you're dead. <laughs> <laughs> because medical science cannot explain. There was absolutely no sign of life. So she was dead on arrival. 
medical science cannot explain that Allah can take a soul and return it. All right? Except that may Allah protect me and you. May Allah protect us from the most horrible punishment he can give. I don't know if there's any punishment worse than this. Yes. I shiver when I think of it. That Allah takes the soul and the family is grieving and they have the ugusul and the salatul janaza and you go to the cemetery and they bury you. But they forgot to put a cell phone when they buried you. So after the people had left the cemetery, then Allah returned the soul. And you wake up and you find the place is so dark. I didn't go to sleep like this. And this is strange clothes that I didn't go to sleep in this clothes. And this smell of camphor, why? He's puzzled. This pitiable man. And he tries to get up. But I can't get up this space. Where am I? So he calls out to Dulhan, Dulhan. <laughs> but no Dulhan. <laughs> He's shouting, nobody's answering. And then slowly and bitterly, he realizes he'd been buried in his own grave. And he'll stay there. He can shout and scream as much as he wants. The only one who will hear him is a dog. And he'll die there. I can't think of a worse death than that. I can't. And so now, we know Allah took his soul and returned it. And then raised him unto himself. So he, she did not die, except the doctor saying to Madam, you're dead. <laughs> and Nabi Isa Islam did not die. But Nabi Isa alayhi salam himself brought the dead back to life on several occasions. How do we explain it? Answer, that Allah took the soul and allowed the soul to be returned through Nabi Isa And that's how he gave life to the dead. And so now, we have a conclusion. And the conclusion is that he did not die. But Allah says, Kullu nafsin zaikatul maut. Every soul must taste maut or death. Mm. And since he did not taste maut, he did not die then the implication which arises from the Qur'an, we're not touching the Hadith, is that he must die one day. And so we say, here is the first proof from the Qur'an, that he will return. And our Prophet <laughs> prophesied that he will return. And when he returns, he will die. And our Prophet said, Alayhi Salatu Islam, you'll perform the prayer, the Salatul Janaza over him. And after he dies, he will be buried. And our Prophet, Alayhi Salatu Islam, said he'll be buried next to me. This is the first proof from the Quran. And so now we turn sorrowfully so to the roadblock. It's not just a nuisance. It's not just something that's false. 
it is something that is dangerously false. That there are those, I don't know how many they are, and that's irrelevant, who declare, and let me choose my words carefully so I am correct in I, my presentation of their view. And I'll tell you where they got the view from later. Who say that when Allah said that he made it appear to them that he was crucified, what happened was that when Auzu Billah Minaza, Allah caused someone else to assume the appearance of the Messiah. And that man was held, and that man was crucified in the place of the Messiah. On Judgment Day, when they stand before Allah, he will ask them, Matu Burhanakum, you said that I have done this, <laughs> that I caused an innocent man who never claimed to be the Messiah. I caused him to assume the appearance of the Messiah. And as a consequence, I caused him to be crucified. Unjustly so. It's an act of injustice. Even a schoolboy would know that this is an act of monstrous injustice. That someone who never claimed to be the Messiah, and you cause him to assume the appearance of the Messiah, and your, what you did now cause this man to be crucified for having claimed to be the Messiah, when he was innocent of that. This monstrous act of injustice that you have attributed to Allah, you'll have to answer for it on Judgment Day. He will ask you, where is the proof? And such people who hold on to this nonsense will be in a very pitiable state on Judgment Day. Now then, we turn now to the second proof in the Quran having disposed of this roadblock. And the angel has come to Maryam to inform her that you're going to have a baby boy. How old was she? Well, she was in the masjid, in the temple, until she reached the age of puberty. Now after this, she can no longer remain in the masjid because women have the menstrual cycle. So she returns to her mother's home. And it is shortly after this that the angel comes. So what will be her age? I think the oldest that I could possibly it will be about 14. So the angel comes <laughs> to tell her, you're going to have a baby boy. One half of Pakistan has no problem with this. But there's another half of Pakistan who will say to the angel, go back. She's still a child. Come back when she's 18. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> I am going, I'm entertained, I don't know about you, but <laughs> that half of Pakistan, which includes parliament, <laughs> which includes your parliament, go back, 
She said, a child, come back when she's 18, telling the angel, go back. <laughs> it's so funny. The angel went on to tell her, this baby is going to be the Messiah, and she knows the subject. But the angel goes on to tell her two more things. And in these two more things are two more proofs of the return of the Messiah. The angel said about the baby who is coming, Your baby, your baby boy will speak to the people as a baby in the cradle and therefore miraculously so. Babies don't speak. Not even in Islamabad, babies don't speak. <laughs> nice to find an audience that smiles. This morning <laughs> I was with another audience. <laughs> I couldn't get him to smile. <laughs> Babies don't speak. So this baby will speak miraculously from the cradle. And this baby will also speak as an adult, but there's nothing miraculous about an adult speaking unless he is dumb. But this baby is not dumb because he's speaking even as a baby. So how can an adult speak miraculously? Those who are bent on disfiguring the Quran and who cannot show integrity in explaining the Quran refuse to accept that the baby was a baby when he spoke. One of them, a distinguished scholar of Islam, who translated and made a commentary of the Quran in English, uh, Muhammad Asad, a man for whom I have great respect, because he came to a different conclusion, he has to twist, pitifully so, this statement, يُكَلِّمُ النَّاسَ فِي الْمَحْدِ And he says, a little boy, the little boy will speak. But it's not a little boy. It's a baby. How do we know that it's a baby? Allah didn't leave it to chance. When she became pregnant, and she goes by herself all alone, not even her mother with her, a terrifying experience for a girl having her first baby and all alone with no one with her. And the pain came upon her. She said, I wish I were dead. And then a voice spoke from beneath her. Could it be the baby? No. Because Allah says, he will speak from the cradle. And as another, he never says he speak from his mother's belly. <laughs> so it has to be the angel. And the voice told her that there's a date palm tree. Shake it, you'll get ripe dates and eat it and refresh yourself. And there's a rivulet running beside you. Take some water, refresh yourself. And then the voice went on to say that if anyone were to speak to you on this day, that the baby is born. Say to them, I've taken a vow of silence for one day, Al-Yawm, for this day. So Allah has given to her a vow of silence for one day. This is a girl. This is a man, Zakaria Alayhisselam. And when he saw her with food in the mihrab, 
He asked, where did you get this food? I didn't give it to you. She said, Allah gave it to me. So he went in the mihrab and he prayed to Allah, give me a son who will inherit from me. And Allah sent the angel to say, yes, your wish is granted, you'll have a son. He said, give me a sign. Allah <laughs> said, the sign is a vow of silence for three days. For a man, three days. For a girl, one day. It makes sense. You wouldn't give the man three days and give the girl three years, would you? It doesn't make sense. So when she gave birth to the baby and she returned to her people, she knew this is the Messiah. And when they said, Mary, Maryam, how could you do such a thing? Your father and your mother were not bad people. They already came to the conclusion that she committed sin. What did she do? Answer, she did not reply. She pointed to the baby. Why? There's only one honest answer. And that is that she had taken a vow of silence for one day. And the vow of silence was still in force. So this was still the day that the baby was born. You don't need a PhD from MIT to understand something so simple that the Ahmadiyya movement can never understand. And all the sheep and the cattle and the goats and the camels who follow Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, who have abdicated their responsibility to think and to study the Quran, they will never understand this. But you and I will understand. The reason why she was silent and did not reply to them is because she had taken a vow of silence for one day. While his was for three days, hers was for one day. And that vow of silence was still in force. And so this is still the day that the baby was born. So Muhammad Asad is wrong. And the Ahmadiyya movement is monstrously wrong. They say he was a big man already. <laughs> and we say, no, it is a baby in the cradle, one day old. She pointed to the baby. They said, how can we speak to a baby in the cradle? And then the baby spoke, hence, miraculously so, to defend his mother. We need not dwell on all the things that the baby said because we are only concerned with this thing. If he spoke miraculously as a baby in the cradle, how will he speak miraculously as an adult? when it is normal for adults to speak. There's only one way we can understand this verse of the Quran. That he will speak miraculously as a baby and miraculously as an adult. That's the only way. For people who think. And the only way he can speak miraculously as an adult is if he has not spoken so far miraculously as an adult. And there is no evidence. All prophets speak. And during his lifetime, he spoke like all other prophets. There's nothing miraculous in a prophet speaking. <laughs> what the prophet conveys from Allah, yes, that's the divine word. But the act of speaking is normal for a prophet. 
So there is no evidence that he has spoken miraculously as an adult. None. And it's too late to manufacture that. <laughs> there is no evidence that Nabi Isa alayhi salam spoke miraculously as an adult. And it is too late to manufacture evidence now. So there's only one way left. That he can speak miraculously as an adult. And that is that Nabi Muhammad wasalam, spoke the truth. That he will return to the world after more than 2,000 years. And he will speak to people. And that would be a miracle. That's the second evidence from the Quran. For those who take the time to study the Book of Allah. And now the third. The baby is born, or the, sorry, the baby is to be born. And the angel is informing Maryam about things that are going to happen in the life of this baby. And the angel goes on to say, وَيُعَلِّمُهُ الْكِتَابِ وَالْحِكْمَةِ وَالْتَوْرَاتِ وَالْإِنْجِيلِ And Allah will teach him the kitab. And Allah will bestow on him wisdom. And Allah will teach him the Torah and the Gospel. Nothing happens in the Quran by accident. So why does Allah say kitab? Answer? Because he wants to give you some homework. He wants you to go to the rest of the Quran. So that the Quran will tell you which kitab it is. <laughs> and when you do that at the beginning of Surah to Ali Imran, you will see where the kitab is the Quran. Nothing happens in the Quran by accident. So Allah will teach him the Qur'an. But why will Allah teach him the Qur'an? When the Qur'an will be revealed only 600 years after he's left the world. He's gone. He's left. He's no longer in the world. And 600 years later, the Qur'an will be revealed. So why would Allah teach him the Qur'an? When the Qur'an will not be revealed for 600 years. And then why will Allah give him wisdom? And after that, Allah will teach him the Torah and the Gospel. I did a whole lecture on this verse at the Iranian Cultural Center in Peshawar yesterday. And you will find that on YouTube channel whenever I get the recording, inshallah. But today we are only concerned with this verse for one subject, and that is the return of the Messiah. There's more to the subject. Not only does the angels tell him Sorry, tell her that Allah will teach him the Quran and give him wisdom and teach him the Torah and the Gospel, but more than that. In Surah Al-Ma'idah on Judgment Day, Allah speaks to Nabi Isa Islam, and says to him, is Alam to Kal Kitab? Did I not teach you the Quran? Well, Hikmah, did I not give you wisdom? What Torah, well, Anjil, did I not teach you the Torah and the Gospel? The verse is repeated. That one is future tense, this one is past tense. 
So now we have to try to answer the question. Why did Allah teach him the Quran and also the Torah and the Gospel? And why did he put wisdom in between? This is our answer. And if we are wrong, we invite you to tell us what is right. We say that the only way that this is relevant, or can be relevant, the knowledge of the Quran, is if he is to return. And when he returns, he's going to return to an Ummah in the Deen of Islam which follows the Qur'an. And he's going to return to another Ummah in the Deen of Islam, which follows the Torah and the Gospel. But he's not sent to this Ummah, he's sent to this one. Because that's what the Qur'an says. Ya Bani Israel, Inni Rasulullahi ilaykum. I am the messenger of Allah sent to you, the Israelite people. Wa Rasulan ila Bani Israel. And the messenger of Allah sent to Bani Israel. Two verses. So if he was sent to Bani Israel, the Israelite people, the first time, or who is going to be sent to on the second occasion? Do we have the authority to change the word of Allah? Haji? Bataye? Haji? Huh? <laughs> Do we have the authority to change the word of Allah? Haji, you do not have the authority. Only Allah can change his word. And when Allah changes his word, he replaces it with something which is better or similar. And he communicates that to us through his revelation or through his prophets. And Nabi Muhammad never told us that Nabi Isa is not going to be coming back to them. He's coming back to somebody else. And so now, our explanation is that this verse is conveying to us the knowledge that Nabi Isa Islam will return and when he returns, he will need the knowledge of the Qur'an. Because he's coming back to an Ummah which follows the Qur'an. That is why Allah had to teach him the Qur'an. He's not coming back as the leader, Amir, Khalifa, but he's coming back as the supreme guide and supreme legal authority. And he's coming back to this Ummah, which he will lead, and he will rule the world as Al Hakim Al Adil, a just ruler. And so he needs a state to rule. And it will be the state of Israel, the holy state of Israel in Jerusalem. And since he will be the ruling state, he will rule. This is the ruling state in the world. So his followers will rule the world. And remember, one, two, three, four, five. Remember? But after number five, and I'm going to raise you unto myself. And I'm going to purify you of the kufr that they have hurled against you. And I'm going to cause those who follow you to be raised to a position over and above and dominant over this other group which rejects you. And when I raise them to that position of dominance, they remain there until the end of the world. Do you remember or have you forgotten already? When you eat Dumba Karai, sometimes you forget, you know. <laughs> this Ummah, which follows Nabi Isa, 
will now become the ruling state in the world. And Nabi Isa Islam will rule. And they will remain like that until the end of the world. So this Ummah is not going to rule the world. Of course, you can't talk to schoolboys. They'll never listen to you. So when he returns, he needs the knowledge of this Sharia. And he needs the knowledge of this Sharia. Because he'll be in between both. And what about matters where both this Ummah and that Ummah interact? How will you judge? <laughs> That's why, well, hikmah, Allah gave him the wisdom to be, because it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. And as soon as he arrives, the challenge immediately begins. Because Allah sends him down in a masjid. Why a masjid? Why not a church? Why not a cathedral? Why not Hagia Sophia? Why a masjid? The divine wisdom is at work. And Allah sends him down at the time when the Salat is to take place. Why at this time? Nothing is happening by accident. The divine wisdom is at work. And Allah sends him down at the time when Amirul Mu'minin, the Khalifa, the Imam of the Muslims, who at that time won't be Imran Khan, or Sayyid Ali Khamenei or Sisi or the one whose name I don't like to remember too much, Erdogan. <laughs> you think they will ever be able to unite this Ummah? Not Mumkin. <laughs> the only way this Ummah can be united under a genuine leader is if Allah does it. <laughs> we can't do it. That's why there's an Imam al Mahdi. And he is there in the masjid. And he's about to lead the Salat and he is the Khalifa. He's the Imam. He's Amir al Mu'minin. And Nabi Isa Islam comes down and the Imam says, This is the son of Mary. Like John the Baptist had said before him. And then invites him to lead the Salat and the first test begins. Requiring hikmah. The Imam invites him to lead the Salat. If you are a Nabi, you must lead the Salat. Not the Imam, you are the Nabi. <laughs> but he declines. <laughs> He says, the people have appointed you as the Amir, you lead. And he performs a Salat behind the Imam. This is Hikmah. But Iran does not, <laughs> Iran doesn't know it as yet. Yes. If he had accepted the invitation to lead the Salat, then according to this Sharia, the Sunnah, of Nabi Muhammad and the Imam had prayed behind him he would immediately have assumed leadership of this Ummah according to this Sharia but Allah did not send him to this Ummah so he would have made a blunder a blunder if he had accepted the invitation so he declines the invitation and the Imam leads and not because the Imam leads the Salat and the Nabi prays behind him, does that mean that the Imam is superior to the Nabi? Iran, you have to go back and study. <laughs> so here is the third proof from the Quran. That this is the explanation that Allah says, I'll teach him the Quran and give him wisdom and teach him the Torah and the Injil. There is more that I can speak on this subject, but just to whet your appetite a little bit. 
as soon as he declines to lead the Salat, this camp has a problem. Because this camp will now have to accept, according to their thinking, that now since he has performed the Salat in this Sharia, this camp says he now is an Ummati. <laughs> This is the second roadblock now. He is now Ummati. He's come back in this Ummah. And he's performing Salat in accordance with this Sharia. And since he's praying behind the Imam, he's not a Nabi anymore. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. My gosh, even a schoolboy wouldn't make this mistake. That Allah appointed him as a Nabi and you have dismissed him. What a pity for them on Judgment Day. People who have lost the capacity to think. By performing his Salat in accordance with our Sharia, in, the face, in facing our Qibla, he's sending a message to this Ummah that while he's not the Amir, your Amir is the Amir, but I have come to teach this Ummah and I'm here to stay. <laughs> and I have come to give you guidance. I am the Supreme Guide, not your Imam, because Allah taught me the Quran. Allah did not teach him. Allah taught me the Quran. So I have come as the supreme guide of this Ummah. And I have come as the supreme legal authority to judge all matters pertaining to this Ummah. And when he performs the Salat in the Masjid, in accordance with our Sharia, he has sent a powerful message to his Ummah. Number one, that the Quran is the word of the one God. Number two, that Muhammad والسلام, is the Nabi and the messenger of the one God. Number three, that everything that the Quran has said about me is absolutely correct. That's the message going to them. <laughs> yes, I have come back to you. I am your leader. But this is the implication of my performing the Salat in the Masjid. But Allah is sending him with something else. How I wish we could be alive on that day to see it that any place that his eyesight can reach, his breath can also reach. As far as his eyesight, his breath can reach. And any kafir that his breath reaches will die. And whosoever rejects the Quran now, when Nabi Isa Islam returns, and rejects the Quran as the word of the one God, and rejects Muhammad as the messenger of Allah, and rejects what the Quran has said about Nabi Isari, becomes a kafir. So make sure you don't enter within his eyesight. <laughs> because you, if his breath reaches you, you will be dead, you'll die. This is our explanation of and he will teach you the book, that's the Quran, and give you wisdom and teach you the Torah and the Gospel. Now we really go to number four of the Quran. And it is in Surah to Zukhraf. And remember that when Allah sent down the Quran, he sent it down as Quran, meaning a recitation. 
the original Quran which was sent down was a recitation, yani, yani, kan kibat. Something that was located in the world of sound. That's the Quran, located in the world of sound. And subsequently, Nabi Muhammad ordered that it should be inscribed. And the scribes will then recite for him and he will listen. He would not read to confirm because he couldn't read. He would listen to confirm that what they have written is correct. And when they wrote, they didn't write with Fatah and Kesra and Dhamma. No, the Arab doesn't need that. These are called diacritical marks, Fatah and Kesra and Dhamma. And this was inserted into the written text of the Quran years and years and years afterwards. There was no Quran. None with a Fatah and Kesra and Dhamma. It is only when non-Arabs entered into Islam in large numbers and they did not have Arabic as their language that you had to insert human beings, not angels. Human beings. And these human beings put in the Fatah and Kesra and Dhamma. And sometimes the same word can be written different ways. <laughs> and here is one example. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah to Zukhraf, about Nabi Isa alayhi salam, وَإِنَّهُ لَعَلَمٌ لِسَّانِ He is the sign of the last hour. This makes perfect sense. He is the sign of the last hour. And this is what Nabi Muhammad said. But someone put in the diacritical marks instead of alamun ayn alif, lam alif, nun dhamma, alamun. Put ilmun instead of alam, ein kesra, a pesh, a pesh, zir zabar pesh in Urdu, zabar zir pesh, ah zir, instead of dhamma, ah uh, sorry, instead of kesra, I don't know the Urdu terms, so they make it wa innu la ilmun lisaa. And he is the knowledge of the hour. Excuse me, even a schoolboy would know that if he is the knowledge of the hour, then we are excused from coming to the conclusion that the knowledge of the hour is with him. How can he be the knowledge of the hour and he doesn't have the knowledge of the hour? Did you understand? You say he is the knowledge of the hour and he doesn't have the knowledge of the hour. <laughs> so if you insist that he is the knowledge of the hour, then you have to concede that he has the knowledge of the hour. Otherwise, we should all go back to school because we can't think. But Allah says no one has the knowledge of the hour, none except him. And in the gospel, up to this day, the gospel says, only the father has the knowledge of the hour, even the son does not. <laughs> so someone did some, you know, Dalme Kuch Kala hai. Someone did that with these diacritical marks. And this is wrong. 
The Quran does not have any mistake. All of these critics will come shouting from the mouth. Look at Imran Hussein, you see the Quran has mistakes in it. Tell these go, school boys go and get, get some rest. <laughs> I'm not saying there's a mistake in the Quran. So don't be, don't be uh, tell lies against me. I'm saying that human beings, when they put in the diacritical marks, made a mistake here. Maybe it was done deliberately, maybe it was done accidentally. And the verse says, وَإِنَّهُ لَعَلَمٌ لِسَّعَى And he is the sign of the hour. And not that he is the knowledge of the hour. Therefore, if he is the sign of the hour, where is the evidence? Nothing in his life until he left the world can provide the evidence that he is the sign of the hour. So where is the evidence that he in the hula alamun disar? He is the sign of the hour. There is only one way that you can explain this verse of the Quran. That he is the sign of the hour and that is if he returns. And that indeed will be the major sign of the hour. This is the fourth proof from the Quran. And we go to one more and I have to excuse you. I have to ask for your excuse for keeping you so long today. The last proof from the Quran. And we have to take our time with it. They started celebrating when they saw him crucified. But there are others who are weeping because they believed that he was the Messiah. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala acted and they're no longer Banu Israel. They're now divided into two. That part which was weeping, they are now called a Nasara. And I don't know why there should be any objections. If they say they call themselves Christians, that is what a Nasara is. But there are some people who object, so I don't care for that. So one part is now referred to in the Quran as an nasara yani the Christians. And the other part which celebrated, who rejected him, are now called al-Yahud, or the Jews. The definition of a Jew in the Quran may differ from yours from Fort Lauderdale. This definition in the Quran is a Jew is someone who belongs to Banu Israel and who rejects Nabi Isa as a Messiah. And now Allah uses a new term for these two. This one who belongs to Banu Israel, this one who belongs to Banu Israel. But now this one believes in the Messiah and this one rejects the Messiah. This is a Nasara, this is a Yehud. And the two are now called Ahlul Kitab. Ahlul Kitab. A new term. And Allah says, in the next verse of Surah Tun Nisa, his anger against what they have done to attempt to crucify Nabi Isa Alayhi the divine anger is so great. He says, Wa im min ahli kitab illa la yu minanna bihi kabla mauti. And there will be none that will escape from amongst the ahlul kitab, but must believe in him before he dies. So Allah is speaking to that part of Ahlul Kitab who rejected him. Not that part which has accepted him. 
ويوم القيامة يكون عليهم شهيدا and on judgment day despite the fact that they accept him before he dies they will he will give evidence against them and they'll go into the hellfire so what does this mean before he dies Every single one of them will have to believe in him before he dies. But there are millions and millions and millions of them who have died since then and did not believe in him. Yes, every Jew has died since that day to this day and did not believe in him before his death. And so what does it mean? No, 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 says some of them. No, when Allah says before he dies, he's not talking about Jesus. He's talking about the Jew. That before a Jew dies, from that day until the end of the world, before a Jew dies, he will have to believe in Jesus. But we have no evidence of that happening for 1400 years now, 2000 years now. No evidence. No, 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 it's while he is dying. While he is dying, then he'll take the <laughs> shahada and believe in him. While he's dying. But that's false. Because the Quran says they will believe in him qabla mawtihi, not hina mawtihi. Hina mawtihi means while he is dying. Qabla mawtihi means before he dies. So this is, excuse me, bagwas. <laughs> so what is Allah saying in this verse? He's saying that before Nabi Isa alayhi salam dies, Every Jew will have to believe in him. Has that happened as yet? No? And so here is the evidence. This has not happened as yet, but the truth is always in the Quran. So the Quran is giving us the information that he's going to come back. And at that time when he comes back, every Jew, no matter where he is, even in the mountains, <laughs> in a cave in the mountain, every Jew will have to believe in him before he, Nabi Isa Islam, dies. But even though you believe in him and you join this Ummah, at that time, because there will be only two ummahs in the world, in one deen, there will be no other deen existing in the world. Allah will destroy them all. Only the deen of Islam will remain. And in the deen of Islam, there will be only two ummahs. So the Jew, when he believes in the Messiah, has a choice of either joining this Ummah or that one. There's no other. But even though he joins an Ummah, the Messiah will give evidence against him on Judgment Day. And you go in the hellfire. And so this verse of the Quran confirms one more time that the Messiah will one day return. I have given you five proofs from the Quran and I have not gone to the Hadith to give you evidence and proof that Jesus will return. I have done this because there are powerful voices now emerging, scholarly voices, Muslims who are now trying to persuade our people that Jesus will not return. 
you know who they are. And this lecture is recorded in order to provide the evidence that such people are misguided. I thank you for your patience. Now we can have questions, inshallah. <laughs>